Hey there, fellow game devs, and welcome back to Souls Game Dev Journey. In our previous episodes, we took our game's visuals to the next level with some stunning terrain generation using the magic of Perlin noise. Today, we're shifting gears towards enhancing the player's interaction with our world. We're about to breathe life into our game's world by giving our camera a much-needed upgrade. Our mission, transform our static camera into a dynamic, player-responsive one, all thanks to the powerful tool known as Cinemachine. Here's the game plan. We're aiming for a camera behavior that's as smooth as butter. Imagine a top-down view that beautifully showcases our entire map while ensuring it stays neatly confined within our grid's dimensions. And when we click on a tile, it glides to the center of our view. But that's not all, a double click. And we're diving into a close-up shot. But don't worry if this sounds like a lot because today, we're taking our first step into this journey. We're starting with the input system, a fantastic tool to kickstart our camera controls. That's right, as of now, our camera is as static as a statue. But soon, we'll breathe life into it. We're diving deep into setting up the input system, and I'm going to guide you through every step. Plus, I'm here to make sure you not only keep up but also customize these controls to fit your unique game. So, what's on the menu for today's episode? To establish the groundwork for camera panning and zooming, we're going to dive into the code to make that camera glide across our world. We'll set up the foundation for selecting and focusing on tiles, even though the real magic will happen in the upcoming videos. By the end of this episode, you'll be well on your way to creating a camera system that'll make your game world come alive. So, let's dive right in. Now that we're all set and pumped to level up our camera controls, let's get into the Unity input system. This tool is your passport to seamless interaction with your game world. We'll start from scratch, so beginners, don't worry, I've got your back. First things first, we need to install the Unity Input System package. Here's how. Open up Unity. Go to the Window menu. Select Package Manager. Now, in the Package Manager, look for Input System and hit that Install button. It's that simple. Once installed, you're ready to roll. Well, almost. You have to restart Unity Editor first. Now, you're ready to roll. Next up, let's create an Action Input Asset. This is like our control center for all things input related. Here's what you need to do. In your project window, right-click to create a new folder if you don't already have one for organization. Line is called Settings. Right-click within the folder, navigate to Create, and select Input Actions. Give it a name, something like Player Controls. Now, double-click the asset you just created to open it up. Now let's have a look at what we have here. First, Control Schemes. Before we dive into creating inputs, let's decide which controller schemes we want to support. Are we going to be using only keyboard? keyboard and mouse, game controller, or something else. On the top left, you'll see a list of control schemes. This is where you can specify which input devices your game will work with. Feel free to choose from a wide range, like keyboard, mouse, gamepad, and more. Let's click on Add Control Scheme. Pick a name for it. Let's call our first one keyboard and mouse. Now, let's add them both to the list. We can save this and just for the sake of it, let's also create a generic controller scheme. This time, we will select a generic controller, but you can also select specific ones if you prefer. Now let's have a look at action maps. Action maps are like categories that group similar inputs together. In our case, we'll create two action maps, one for world interaction movement and another for UI interaction. If there's other kinds of interactions like battle system, swimming, flying, etc., you'd segment them here. It's all about keeping things organized. To create an action map, right-click in the empty space under Action Maps, or on the plus in the header. Select Add Action Map and give it a name, like World. Now that we've got our action maps, let's add some actions to them. These are the interactions that players will use to control the camera and interact with the world. Here's what I want to do for now. I want to be able to pan the camera with the keyboard, zoom with keyboard or mouse. I will also want to select and focus a hex cell by either clicking on it or press a keyboard key. Now let's break this down into actions and interactions. Within your action map, right-click under actions and select add action. Or click on the plus sign in the header. Name the action pan. In the action properties section, change action type to value and control type to vector 2 for our 2D movement. Add a new binding to the action by pressing on the plus sign next to the action and select Add Up, Down, Left, Right Composite. Now assign the keys you want to use with each of them. You can also switch the scheme on the top left to Gamepad and select New Binding option. You'll see that you are already presented with the most appropriate options for 2D movement in D-Pad, Left Stick and Right Stick. I'll switch back to the Keyboard and Mouse scheme and move on to Zooming. Add another action and name it Zoom. For this action, we'll use the keys Q and E for zooming in and out. 
This means we will select action type value again, but use axis instead. In the binding, we will choose add positive, negative binding and assign the keys. I also want to zoom with scroll wheel on the mouse, so I will add another binding, this time selecting the first option add binding and select scroll Y from the options. For the zoom to work the way I find most intuitive, I know I want to invert it, so with the scroll Y mouse binding selected I will add an invert processor. And since one step of the turn gets a value of 120 for the mouse wheel will adjust the keyboard binding. Click on it and change the min value and max value to be minus 120 and plus 120 respectively. I actually want both the zooming and panning to only happen if I hold down the keys so let's add hold interaction to the zooming keyboard binding. For the panning we can add it to the whole action as we're not using the mouse. Finally let's add select and focus. Since I want to use the F key for both I'll just add the focus action and we will differentiate between the two in code. This time we leave the action type on button and add a binding for the F key. The easiest way to do that is to click on the path and then on the listen button. Press the key you want to assign, in this case F, and select it from the drop down. This time we will add the multi-tap interaction and leave it on 2. I will adjust the max tap spacing and set it to 0.4, otherwise the select function will be too laggy the way I planned to set it up. Now I will add the left mouse button click the same way I added the F key, and I'm done with the selection and focus for now. If you want to add the gamepad controls you can do it in the same way, just don't forget to switch to your gamepad scheme or make sure that you have the correct control scheme selected in the binding properties. Don't forget to save your action input asset after setting up your action maps and inputs. Click on the save asset button and if you want to be safer in the future, turn on auto save in the top bar. Now think about how you'd like to navigate through the UI, which actions you need and set it up. You won't have to worry about using keys from other action maps as only one action map will be active at a time. Fantastic! We've just crafted our action maps for world interactions and UI controls. Our camera, selection, and UI navigation are all set up and ready to roll. Next we'll jump into the code to bring these controls to life, starting with camera panning. We're going to create a camera target in our scene, apply the player input script to it, configure our input actions, set some defaults, and briefly explore the behavior options. First things first, let's create a camera target game object in your scene. This will be our focal point for camera movement. Here's how. In the hierarchy window, right click and create an empty game object. Name it something like camera target. Now that we have our camera target, it's time to give it the ability to respond to our input actions. We'll apply the player input script. Select the camera target game object. In the inspector window, click add component. Search for and add the player input component. With the player input component added, let's link it to our previously created action input asset. In the player input component, find the actions field. Drag and drop your action input asset into this field. It's a good practice to specify default input actions for your camera target. This ensures that your camera behaves predictably when the game starts. For example, in the player input component, you'll see fields for default scheme. I'll have mine be keyboard and mouse. I don't really care too much about the controller yet, so I'll disable auto switch. And for now, I'm starting in a gameplay scene with no UI, so my default map will be world. In the main menu scene, for example, I would set this to UI. Now, let's dive into the various behavior options available for the player input component. The first option is send messages. This option will effectively call methods that are listed below on all scripts on this game object. As you can see, these are some default ones in all our actions, with on before them. So pan action will call on pan method. The second option is broadcast messages, which will do exactly the same as send messages, but to all the child objects as well. Then we have invoke unity events. Unity events are versatile and easy to iterate with. You can link your methods to events right from the inspector, which makes it quick and easy. Lastly, we have invoke C sharp events. Similar to unity events, C sharp events allow you to execute custom code when an input event happens. This is a similar approach with less overhead but more time consuming when changing. Each of these behavior options provides different ways to handle input events in your game. Depending on your project's needs and your coding preferences, you can choose the one that fits best. My preference is to use events, and since I am still very much experimenting, I will use the Unity Events option. And there you have it, folks. We've created our camera target, applied the player input script, configured input actions, set defaults, and explored the behavior options. We've done a great job setting everything up in the editor. Now comes the part where we actually start responding to the events and move the camera target around. Let's start by creating a script called camera controller. 
We can remove the update method and think about some properties we'd like to have to fine-tune the control. But first, we'll need a reference to the camera target game object. Since I know I will be using Cinemachine, I'll also create a Cinemachine virtual camera field called Virtual Camera, which we will use once we set it up. Now, for those fine-tuning options. For the panning of the camera, I can only think of the speed option for now. So let's add it first. There may be more settings required for the zooming, but since we will be zooming by changing the field of view of the camera, we can worry about it later. I will be using a coroutine for the panning and zooming instead of the update method. And since I want to cancel it, I will add a coroutine file called pan coroutine to reference it from the script. To respond to the pan action event, I will create a method called on pan change, which will take a callback context parameter called context. In it, we want to respond to different phases of an input action event. The phases are start, performed, and cancel. There's also a waiting phase, but that doesn't have a callback. For the pan action, I'm interested in performed and canceled phases. If we've performed the action, meaning we've not only pressed, but held the button down for the specified time, I want to start the coroutine to process the panning and I'll send it the context as well. But before that, if there's already a panning coroutine running, I want to stop it so that we can seamlessly change directions. If we get to the cancelled phase, meaning we let go of the key, we want to stop the panning. But we also want to be sure that there's something to cancel. Great, the easy part is done. Now let's think about how we're actually going to be handling the movement. Let's create a process pan with callback context called context. First, we will want to get the direction of movement. We will get it by reading the vector2 value in the context and store it in an input vector field. Now, we should decide what to do with this information. We want to move in 3D, so we need a vector3 we can call move vector. We will put the x component of the input vector in the x of move vector, and y component of the input vector into the z component of the move vector. The y component will be set to 0, at least for now. And finally, we can change the position of the camera target by adding the direction of move vector multiplied by the camera speed and elapsed time from the previous frame to it. All of this we will want to keep repeating for the whole time the coroutine is running. If we now go into the editor and find the pan event in the player input script, we can add the on pan changed method to it. That's after we've added the camera controller script to the camera target of course. We also need to connect the camera target game object to the script and now we can test it out. We should see that after we hold down the WASD keys, we move in the correct direction. On top of that, we should be able to transition smoothly between going in different directions. Great! Our target is moving and the camera will be able to follow it. We can't do much more until we set up the Cinemachine and Hex interactions. But we can discuss how we will use the focus action for selecting and focusing at the same time, so that you can think about how you could use something similar in your own projects. Let's go back to the script and create an onFocus change method, which will again take the callback context parameter. Here we will be interested in performed and cancelled phases. I will only be adding debug calls for now as an example. Let's talk about what's going on. If the phase in this context is started, then the key has been pressed down. We know we want to do something, but since we have two actions, we don't know which one just yet. If we get to the performed stage, the key has been double tapped and we want to perform whatever actions we want to do for focus. If on the other hand we get to the cancelled phase, we know the key has been pressed, but the double tap hasn't happened on time. This means that we probably want it to select. Notice that select will only happen after the time for double tap has passed. This is why the time window for the tap should be as small as possible, otherwise the interaction will feel laggy. There is an alternative way to do this in that WAB be with modifiers. When you add a binding with a modifier, you are essentially saying you want it to only trigger when multiple keys are pressed together. For example, Shift and F. This means you could do select on pressing the F key only, and focus on Shift plus F. Here's an example for copy and crouch. If only press C, I want to crouch, but if I press Ctrl and C I want to copy. Notice though that if you press Ctrl and C both will be triggered. After all both is true, C has been pressed and Ctrl and C have been pressed. If you don't want this behavior, Unity has made some improvements, and they've given us an option to only trigger the more modified action first. To do this, you need to go into the input system settings and select the enable input consumption option. Now, if we press Ctrl and see only the copy action will trigger. There we go. With all of this you should be able to create a fairly comprehensive input system for your game. We've covered action maps, actions, and bindings. We've shown how to use some interactions in a processor as well as how to use modifiers in a more intuitive way. 
In the future, we will want to work with our input system from the code so that we can switch the action maps, allow users to rebind keys, etc. But first, we will set up Cinemachine and get it to follow our target as well as Zoom. We will cover this in the next video in the series. Before you go, I want to tell you that I've created a Discord channel. You can find the link below. If you have more complex questions, want to start a discussion or have any suggestions, you should leave them there. If there's anything unclear in the videos, you can look there to see if anyone can help you. I hope this video on the Unity input system made you confident in using it yourself. If it helped you out, please consider subscribing and leave a like.